was the worst professional experience of my career. And this was before the Me Too movement. I felt humiliated and degraded. What can you say about that experience? Rebel Wilson! An award-winning Hollywood superstar. Okay, here we go. My dad would say horrible things to my mum. Fat, lazy cow, no one will ever love you. And I had issues with food because I had low self-worth and that's why I would trash my body. I felt my life wasn't going to be anything. But then I found motivational tapes that said, the brave put down their fears and go forward. And so I decided to go out into the world and make a name for myself. And then I noticed on stage that people like laughing at bigger people. I thought, I could use this to my advantage. I gained all this weight. My body was like at 102 kilos. And then I came to America. Now I'm making millions of dollars from playing the fat, funny girl. I'm living this amazing life. But you achieve it and then it's not enough. And I was still a virgin, never dated properly. And this biological clock, you could hear it going tip, 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 tip. I went to the fertility doctor and the doctor looks me up and down and goes, you're not healthy. And it like it really sunk in, I've got to fix this. But as soon as I started telling people in my team, they're like, oh no, 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 no. Why would you want to lose weight? Cause then you lose your multi-million dollar career. You're just going to throw it away. Was that your hardest moment? No, the darkest point in my life was when I was 13 and Congratulations, Diary of a CEO gang. We've made some progress. 63% of you that listen to this podcast regularly don't subscribe, which is down from 69%. Our goal is 50%. So if you've ever liked any of the videos we've posted, if you like this channel, can you do me a quick favor and hit the subscribe button? It helps this channel more than you know, and the bigger the channel gets, as you've seen, the bigger the guests get. Thank you and enjoy this episode. Rebel. I, I think to understand somebody, you have to understand their earliest context. And as I read through your book, Rebel Rising, which is out now, I was surprised in many ways, but also the person that I'd seen on a screen made sense in a bunch of different ways. So let me throw that question to you as the first question, which is, if I, if I was to endeavor to understand you, what do I need to know about your earliest context? Yeah, I guess some people see you on screen and they have this image of what you are like. Um, and often, I guess, people would think some overly confident, uh, very confident in her sexuality and, uh, you know, just a kind of brash, ballsy person. But uh, from my upbringing, uh, I mean, I think I couldn't be more the opposite. I mean, I grew up in a pretty regular suburban Australian upbringing, but was extremely shy to the point where like you'd never think that I would choose entertainment for a career. Like that would just be unimaginable uh, for this, ex like bordering on some kind of social disorder, shyness. And, and then coming from quite a humble beginning of being in a family where we made money selling pet products out of a yellow caravan at dog shows. And so driving around the country to these dog shows and selling like pooper scoopers to pick up the poop for the dogs and uh, brushes and leads for the dogs and and all these things. And so it wasn't, also I was allergic to dogs. So that's why my <laughs> uh, <laughs> my childhood always felt a little bit uncomfortable, which I never realized why until later when I got tested as an adult um, that I was allergic. And, uh, and so I think by by writing the book, uh, people can see this whole other dimension of me and kind of maybe why I have the personality that that I have now. What about your parents? So my mum was a school teacher in, in state schools, um, so had a lot of like refugee students and students that came in not knowing English and and she mainly taught kindergarten, so like all these kids. So she's just like a light you know, light of a woman, like just a brilliant teacher. I helped so many young people. And for some parts of my childhood, she was just a stay-at-home um, mum, which I shouldn't say just because now I'm realising uh, being a mum is like the hardest thing ever. And then my dad was someone who his, his father died uh, suddenly when he was 18 in his final year of high school. Uh, so... Uh, I think that threw his life what was supposed to be his life off course and he 
kind of had emotional issues from from losing his dad suddenly that young um and in a tragic way so he um he had I believe you know wanted to be a businessman and wanted to be successful but I guess because of his own emotional issues and stuff didn't quite fully achieve his his potential how do you know that your father didn't quite achieve his potential what were like the symptoms of that because you seem to be quite sure that 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 was um causal in something i think cuz he was so angry all the time and money was a source of um uh fighting in the in the household so uh, and I just like, so for example, we'd go to the racetrack with the horses and my dad sometimes would own like a one-tenth or one-twentieth of a racehorse in a syndicate. Um, and he'd look at the other high flyers, rich people who'd had had a lot of money and were successful and people knew their names and stuff. And I definitely saw that he wanted to be that, but he wasn't that. Nobody was coming up to him and shaking his hand or admiring him. And then in one of the um, chapters of the book, I write about, I found this gym bag in the back of his car and it was full of all these cassettes. And I just took them. Nobody ever said anything uh, why they were there or what. And I noticed they were all motivational tapes. Um, And the one that I clearly remember was one called How to Win Friends and Influence People. And I think... This was my father's way of trying to improve himself and trying to be better. And a lot of the tapes were about business, about selling and um, how to be better in in business. And and so I feel like what, even though we never openly discussed it, I feel like why would he have those kind of things? Because he wanted to better himself. I just don't think he had the the ability to. And then his life just didn't go in the way that he wanted to. And I think uh, because of the death of his father, he just never seemed to be able to process emotions properly. Um, That was the best way. Probably nowadays you would go to someone and get diagnosed with what kind of issues you had or seek therapy or or something like that to get over the trauma. But I guess back in Australia in those days that wasn't a thing. Um, And so he was a man who just, you know, wanted to be better but then just couldn't, like, uh, just didn't have the skills, the emotional skills. That trauma eventually finds an outlet either way. If you don't address it through, like, therapy, it finds other ways to manifest itself. And what were those ways? And I think with him it was being uh, angry and he would just turn from all of a sudden talking normally to Mm. he would go really red in the face, like, just, like, uh, just it was almost like a red balloon suddenly like his face would almost expand and he'd go really red and he'd just have these absolutely like angry outbursts where he'd do and say horrible things and and I think that that was probably stemming from when he lost his father in an unfair way um and and he just didn't know how to deal with it so probably like you know if he is now and if you know I would be like, oh, you know, you should talk to someone, a professional, and process your emotions properly. And but, but then back then, I guess we didn't, we didn't really know what to do or say. That was just his personality. To bring this into into light, I guess the the example you give in the book is when you're, I think you're twelve or something years old, and you decide you were young. It was the summer. It was hot. Yeah. And you decide to wet the bed to cool yourself down. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we got back from a dog show and. It was really hot. Sometimes in Australia we have like these really hot, like 36 degree days. And so we thought, well, we'll pour water all over the mattress to like wet it down so we kind of be lying in coolness. Um, And then my father came in and just, he thought, I think we'd literally wet the bed, you know, like gone to the toilet on the bed, which we never would have done. We were like, looking back, we were like the most well-behaved children you could imagine. Um, And he just like he just it was like a flick a switch would flick you know and he'd just go up really angry and would just start whacking us and it was just um uh, it was I don't know it just seemed to it just something would tick him off or something and he'd just lose it um and, and that was one of the incidents but I was really young I think I was about eight okay. and my sister was six Liberty 
And when I spoke to her about writing the book and she was like, she doesn't totally remember that exact instance, but she remembers several others that are very similar mm-hmm. um, things. But that one I just remembered really clearly. And then I felt like a terrible person because I thought, oh, well, why did I wet the sheets and the mattress and I was trying to cool down, but that was wrong and I should never have been naughty like that. Um, and it just kind of, um, yeah, really stuck to me that that particular time, but that was something that would happen, uh, you know, quite a bit. And this sort of physical aggression mm. and emotional abuse would continue to your mother as well. It would extend to your mother as well. Yeah, more with my mum, it was more emotional abuse, like um, come home and say, oh, you fat, lazy cow, what have you done all day? Um, stuff like, oh, you know, when I'll ever love you. Um, just like these comments that would just come constantly and also more financial abuse, like he'd take control of the finances but then go and gamble with the money and then we'd have no money. And um, so so more with that, um, but with the kids it was more the, you know, the physical hitting, which was not uh, was not that uncommon in the area I grew up in. I mean, I know now like I could never think of hitting my child now I just would never, but back then it, w- it was quite common and we did have family friends that their dad would hit them with a belt, which was kind of a bit even worse. Um, so we kind of felt like, like we didn't know anything that different. It was quite common. I, I ask those particular questions because it, I often think that we learn our first model of what love is and what a relationship is by what we observe with our parents. Mm-hmm. And for me, I know for sure that watching my parents, how they interacted, left me with a message that I absolutely do not want to be in a romantic relationship. And I avoided that Uh, for my whole life. (laughs) Yeah, that's probably why I never dated anybody ever. (laughs) Um, Because I saw my parents, my mum kind of became a shell of a woman and had to have every ounce of strength in order to get out of that relationship eventually when I was like 16, 17. And that left me thinking, I will never get married um, I, I don't want to be in a partnership with somebody like this is terrible, uh, because often when my dad would have his outbursts or whatever, it was always at home. It was not in public. It was not around other people. It was like, just, uh, just when we were at home and I went, who would want that? Like there was nothing loving about it. And, and I think even though I had one boyfriend when I was 16 <laughs> and, and then he, uh, cheated on me with a friend and and then I was like that's it and um and then from then throughout the whole of my teenage and 20s like did not date one person because I guess I I didn't want to be like my mother and and have this like awful thing happen that you know obviously now the story is great for my mum she's now um engaged to a great man and who's awesome and so kind and loving but uh, my only representation, I guess, was their marriage and it was awful. Like it was just, yeah, even when they separated, it took seven years to, uh, and basically left them, my mum with nothing because all the money went to the lawyers um, from the separation costs. And I was just like, oh, like why would I want that? Mm-hmm. I go, no, I would like to be successful and go out into the world and make a name for myself. And a romantic relationship would only cause me pain, only drag me down, uh, not allow me to be my true self. Um, so I thought, yeah, I just thought I would never, I'd never wanted one until you get real lonely when you become successful. And then you're like, oh, maybe, <laughs> maybe things can change. <laughs> what am I going to do with all this stuff? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think some of my darkness comes, this is a quote from your book, I think mm-hmm. some of my darkness comes from my dad. There is definitely convict history on that side of my family a lot of dodginess when you say a lot of my mm-hmm. darkness it's it's interesting because i remember sitting with tim grover who i reference a lot and tim grover was the guy who coached michael jordan and um kobe bryant for pretty much you know the most significant parts of their career oh, yeah i think i've listened to that oh, episode really? yeah yeah oh, good. yeah amazing and he, i'm a big um, basketball fan yeah yeah, yeah. he's a, it was incredible and one of the things he said to me early was that everyone has their dark side mm-hmm. and then which it is often from their early experiences and all those kinds of things. And then it's often, our light side is often created by our dark side in many respects. Yeah. So, 
it, it, I see shades of what I would guess was your dark side in, in those early years of, of your um, story. But when you say that your dark side probably came from your father, what are you referring to? So I kind of feel like um, that I have friends in the industry, right, who have had like quite awesome childhoods and, you know, and and to me sometimes in their work they come across as very vanilla and, and then I was thinking about, I go, why aren't they as interesting or something? And they're great and they're talented, but they're just not as interesting. And then I normally, when I you chat to them, you find out, oh, they have two loving parents and they had a great childhood. Um, and so for me, I think why I have certain parts of my personality and like to do comedy and stuff is because I have this, I have a lightness, which definitely comes from my mum and my mum's side of the family that are all like that. And then on my dad's side, it's just like dodginess everywhere <laughs> and like, like uh, I don't, you know, alcoholism and like addictions and, um, and, uh, and just also a mentality of just, I don't know how to explain it best apart from saying it's a bit dodgy, but in a way, and then sometimes when, uh, I mean, I don't suffer from like actual depression or whatever, but then sometimes if you're feeling like you, oh, you know. Uh, sometimes I, it feels like a mafia sensation when you're like, oh, I want to get revenge on those people or something. You know, uh, we, I'm like shocked of where these feelings come from, and they're normally from the dark side. <laughs> um, but if I didn't have that, I don't think I'd be as interesting as a as a person or as a performer. Mm. Um, and I definitely like have sometimes have an edginess to jokes and stuff, which I guess I wouldn't have had if I, if I didn't have, you know, one side of the family be, be a bit dodgy, um, and the other side be light. So I knew, I knew the difference and I knew I kind of had both. But you can embody me. both. And yeah. that's quite interesting. Yeah. When someone can <laughs> present as both at the same time, a little yeah. bit sadistic as well, but oh. <laughs> In the, in the in the cover of your book, it says um, that you're always questioning, am I good enough? Mm-hmm. I can relate for many reasons of my own to do with like coming here when but I was... do you think, Stephen, that's why you're successful? I because would... you're asking yourself that question? I think it's intrinsically linked to why I was apparently so driven. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which I, I've, come to, I've come to ask myself in recent years, am I actually driven or am I being dragged by something? They both mm-hmm. look the same. Yeah. But when you're dragged, it's more... It's there's it's there's less control, <laughs> yeah. Less ability to stop and slow down. And uh, you're a workaholic. I read that. Yeah, in the pages oh yeah, of the definitely. Book. So I think maybe <laughs> you're also in the dragged category to some degree. And my dragging came from being not enough in the context I was, you know, only black kid, poorest family in the area. So you're there's a deep sort of sense of shame and insecurity that you're trying to fill, prove to others and yourself that you're you're not. My question mm. was about when that started in you. What made you? Can you? look back and find out what made you feel like you weren't enough? I think I definitely get self-esteem and self-worth from achievements. Um, And so when it was in school, it would be getting 100% in every exam and that would be good. And if I didn't, I'd feel bad about myself. And then, I don't know, just generally being successful in things gives me, like makes me feel good about myself. But then I was thinking about one of the reasons why I had... uh, issues with food and because I had low self-worth and and then I felt like I was not good enough. I was like trash and that's why I would trash my body because I just felt like, well, I don't deserve anything different. And then that's a really complicated question to work out, well, why don't I feel good enough? Um, and and I've thought about it a lot and, and some things I know, but then some things I think I, I don't know why. Some things are as simple as like, for example, being born a girl in the area where I was from and boys were more praised. Like even at the dog shows, it, everyone did something called junior handling. And then if a boy ever entered, he'd normally win because it was like, oh, a boy's doing it. Uh, whereas girls just weren't seen as being as good. Um, the boys' school, I went to an all-girls high school, but the boys' school next door was, was seen as more prestigious and better um, and, um, and they had the multi-million dollar theater at their school and, you know, it was just, um, and, and so I think 
some of it is just as simple as like being born a girl in in the area. And I was like, God, that's so dumb though. Why didn't I um, <laughs> like <laughs> transcend that? And then some of it must have been from not feeling love, although obviously I know my parents love me very, very much. But um, because of I came from a very conservative family, we didn't really talk about emotions and feelings. And so it wasn't expressed in the way that I probably needed it to. So I, I didn't feel good enough unless I was getting first in my grade in a subject or something. And then, uh, and then I was congratulated. And so then I felt good, um, or winning a prize or a trophy. And and that's when you would get the praise from the people you cared yeah, about. Yeah. And so I just kind of went with that. Um, uh, but it's just, but then it's like, I like, there was nothing wrong with me. I go, why did I not feel good enough? But I guess I've always felt that. Um, and it's kind of sad when you think about it because you're like, why would somebody, it's not like I did anything bad or, you know, I should have felt ashamed of, about something. I just always felt like that. I guess it proves that kids, they don't, they're not born with perfect self-esteem. They do need that to be fostered and poured into and nourished or else there can be an absolute, so what I'm yeah. saying is there doesn't have to be something that happened that proved you weren't good enough, but there could just be maybe something that didn't happen that proved you were. Mm, and I think there's all these little micro things that can happen. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you're not chosen for something or you're not, uh, you're always at the back at the side or, you know, you're not ever the star or just all these little things or no one ever thought you'd make it or be anything. Mm-hmm. Um, and just like little things, like little comments people would say or something. And then, um, yeah, and then that all just adds up. And you, you're 13, 14, you're in school, you're shy. Mm-hmm. At this point, I'm guessing you, you have that struggle with feeling like you're good enough. I think that's maybe a, sh- a symptom of the shyness. Yeah, yeah. Shy. yeah. And also, like, I was just very average looking. I had, like, a snaggle tooth. What's a snaggle uh, tooth? <laughs> so it's like a, basically a deformity, like okay. a deformed tooth, like, on one side, which I've had fixed yeah. now. But it's like, kind of like a fang, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But only on one side, so it wasn't, like, some cool vampire thing. Okay. Um, um, and then I had that, and I was so painfully shy where I'd go red in the face if a teacher asked me to answer a question in class, even though I knew the answer. It was just, it was so embarrassing and I didn't have any friends. Um, and I guess because I thought, well, why would people want to be friends with me? I'm not good looking or popular or cool in any way. And and so I just, yeah, it was, it was really, that was like one of the darkest times, like when I like 13, 14, and, and like, you know, people are kind of becoming themselves at that point. And then I read this article in the library that said that what your personality is at 15 will be your personality for life uh, because I used to eat my lunches in the library just by myself, so I was reading stuff all the time. And then I read this and I went, oh, like I'm so close to 15. If I don't change, this is going to be me forever. And can I imagine my life, like, not expressing anything to anybody, just like being just shy and introverted and isolated. And I just knew I didn't want that, that that wouldn't have been the happy life for me. And not that there's anything wrong with being shy, like shy sometimes can be like a superpower. You observe people and you, um, you know, you learn a lot by by observing. But then I just was like, no, I want to have friends and I want to have fun and be popular and and so I was like, oh, well, I better get a move on. And luckily I found those motivational tapes. <laughs> and, then, yeah, <laughs> and then they helped me um, because I thought I want to be somebody that expresses myself. Like literally you'd look at me uh, and I sometimes see it in my niece now. I think she has a similar thing. Like and it's almost like you wouldn't be able to register anything that's going on. You wouldn't know if I'd had a good day or a bad day. I just it'd just be like no no expression or anything, um, and then I I was like okay I'm gonna force myself to like come out of my little cocoon or my shell or um, whatever the metaphor is and just break out and with the help of those tapes and like and having a strategy and how to do it. What was the strategy? Uh, well, there were all sorts of things, but I remember from that How to Win Friends and Influence people, there was something about talking to five new people every day 
And so that was one of the first things I did. And like talking to girls on the bus or just, you know, walking up through the school gates and talking, just talking to the person next to me and saying hi. And what you realize is that there's other people as lonely and as isolated as what you are. And that might have been the highlight of their day to speak to somebody new. And, you know, instead of just sitting in the library all day waiting for friends to find me, which they never would, why don't I actively go out and join like sp other sport teams or other clubs at the school and like actively try to make friends? Like it's not just going to happen if you're just doing nothing. Um, so there were these little tips and strategies, um, but one of which was to get attention, which was to be essentially to be naughty, to get attention. It's kind of like that, uh, you know, Eminem, the rapper, if he hadn't have put out all these songs that were like really controversial and had, you know, outrageous things in them, would he have been a successful rapper? Probably not. And so it was kind of like I then had to do some dodgy things at school to get known, to get like a reputation, mm -hmm. which was against my natural personality because I was such a good little girl. Um, but I had to do things, outrageous things to get attention. And then that led to popularity. And then once you have the popularity, you don't need to do that stuff. But yeah. Is, is there some kind of a link there between you, the career you would then pursue as an actress, as a performer, um, a comedian, all of those things, and this sort of early desire to have attention and validation from, you know, your peers? Well, I think it started from just <laughs> like a more normal thing about wanting to have friends mm -hmm. and wanting to be invited to some parties. And um, so it, it started it started from that and, and like, and then you wanted to be respected, but then to be respected, people first have to know who you are. And so sometimes you have to do that attention seeking behavior to get that. Um, but, but the, uh, how I got into like acting was really, well, my mum dragged me into it because, um, I mean, the studies on that creative arts can really help your self-esteem and self-confidence. It's like insane. Like it's really good for young people who are struggling. And my mum could see me like struggling and having no friends. And so mum takes me to these drama classes at this community centre and literally has to drag me out of the car. I'm holding onto the car door with my fingernails, <laughs> like going, no, 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 I don't want to go. It's so traumatic. But she was doing it not because she wanted me to become an actor. Like, we don't have any professional entertainers in the family. Like, you know, uh, nobody I know was in the business or whatever. At that point, it was more to help my self-confidence and self-esteem through the creative arts. And weirdly, it really did because when you're shy like I was, to play different characters, it's like an escape because it's not really me. It's a different character and and then you can perform as that person and then eventually some of that confidence starts coming to you the real you um uh, from from doing that but obviously at the time nobody thought I would become a professional actress or they would have laughed about, mm. <laughs> about that scenario it's it's interesting because you can see these different drives forming within you you've got this drive for um I don't know you might say for validation externally but then mm. because you come from a family that didn't have money there's also where you were rewarded for academic success or being successful at something there's also this drive to be successful which shows up in early in your story when you start selling things and buying things and then you do exceptionally well in school um you go off to board boarding school at sort of 16 years old mm. i think in part it sounds like to escape from the childhood the household dynamics of your father and your mother yeah um you do exceptionally well there as well exceptionally well and then you end up in Africa South yeah, Africa I know which is it's like a, random uh so you know a lot of people do the gap year yeah, yeah, yeah. thing and I mean it's random but basically I was a witness in a major crime squad investigation when I was in my final year of school I witnessed something and I had to testify and then uh, through that, some people were very impressed with my ability to go and do that in, in a case. And so I was like, and and they told me about this program that was, uh, it's a rotary program and it was called a Youth Ambassador 
um, program and basically they wanted young people who were very good at public speaking. And by this point I'd done, I'd forced myself to do debating and public speaking and I had to get over my shyness. And so I was quite a good speaker and, and I got recommended into this program and got selected and you don't get to choose what country you go to. They, they just select for you. So, and they sent one boy and one girl from our district over uh, to different countries and I got given South Africa. And I was like, cool, cool, because I thought it was going to be like The Lion King the first, <laughs> which was one of my favorite movies. And then I go rock up to South Africa a few years post-apartheid and it was so different to Australia. Like Australia is very safe. <laughs> Johannesburg had the highest uh, rape and murder rate in the world at that time. And there were guns everywhere and barbed wire fences and, you know, attack dogs. And it was like, it was so eye-opening, but then to also uh, be constantly aware of the violence and like I had to carry a little, like a wooden baton, like what you see like an old, you know, policeman in a cartoon would would carry because I literally, if somebody attacked me, I'd have to hit them on the head with it. And it was like, I was like, this is crazy. Like there was, there was so much going on that year um, and but that's how I got the malaria, uh, which forced me to have this vision that I was to become an actress. And I think if I'd never, ever gone to Africa, I never would have had that life-changing vision. And I probably just would have gone back to law school and and been, been a lawyer in, in Australia. Me and you both share that in common. We both were in Africa and got bitten by a mosquito. Did you have a vision? I had a vision. What was your vision? So I, my dad was holding, so I was, we were in our house and they didn't know that I had malaria. Uh -huh. This is what my dad and my mum tell me. I was very young. They were yeah. holding me here and I was, I'd woken up in the night because I said there was a man by my bed. Mm. So they'd picked me up thinking like, oh my God, there's this man in his bedroom. And that when my dad was holding me like this, so I can see over his shoulder, the man would be behind him. Mm. And I was freaking out that there's a man behind him, yeah. um, which I was later would call the shadow man and wrote a little novel about when I was about 14. Yeah. And this, this shadow man, um, because I was losing my mind, they took me to hospital. And at hospital, they found out that I had malaria. But in hindsight, they tell the story that that's, that man saved my life. Oh. You know what I mean? So I grew up very, I grew up with this idea that I had a guardian angel because oh, the shadow man but it was who's... just malaria and hallucinations yeah well like tell I me guess about your hallucinations i had a na nasty strain of malaria and um it was put in hospital <laughs> and uh, you know malaria is so different i don't know whether you remember because of how old you were no. but it's uh, it felt like just felt like i was not in my body and and then they take me into hospital and give me these drugs and then i and then i just started hallucinating and i hallucinated that i was an actress and i was so good that i win an academy award and I must have, I mean, I'd seen the Oscars on TV. I'd obviously never been. And um, and then I just walked down the aisle and it was so real. Like I could see all the people with the dresses and I get up on stage and then I give an acceptance rap rather than an acceptance <laughs> speech because I thought, oh, yeah, that's hardcore. And at one point I had wanted, I had wanted to be a rapper because of their coolness and swagger. Um, uh, it didn't work out for me, um, still luckily, time. Still time. Uh, but my little rap group with my sister, yeah, didn't work out. But, and it was so vivid and real, like I could, like I can still remember it. And then I came out of hospital, I was in hospital for two weeks. I came out and I was like, I think I've got to become an actress now. I've had this vision and people go, ah, no, like the malaria has affected your brain. Uh, they're, they're just like, they thought I was nuts. Like they thought I was crazy. And I go, no, I've seen it. And they're like, no, no, no. Like you've, you've got into the best law school in Australia. Like maybe go to law school and have a great career. And I'm like, nah, I've seen it. And I, and I think I need to be an actress now. And then I left South Africa a month earlier. I was supposed to be there a full 12 months. I left a one month earlier uh, to audition for a drama school in Australia, which I did got rejected because obviously I was terrible. Um, and, and nobody looked at me and go, actress, nobody. So, um, <laughs> yeah. And, and it still took, I think from that vision five years until I really got it, you could make money from acting. Uh, but I, it was like the vision came to me and I watched a lot of Oprah and Oprah was like, well, the universe will tell you like, 
first it'll come in little whispers and then it'll be like bricks falling on you. And I was like, but see, I've, I've had the vision. I have to, I have to do acting now. Um, in hindsight. Yeah. Was that a malaria hallucination or was it divine intervention? I don't know. I think, is, was that some subconscious desire that I was never brave enough to say to anybody? Um, because I was in the high school musicals and plays, um, you know, in the musical, I was like never cast as the lead or whatever, mm. but I really enjoyed it. Like I, I really did enjoy it. And so, but I just never thought someone like me could have a career in that area. So I was like, was that just a subconscious desire that just decided to come out when I was deathly ill? Or was it some kind of, I don't know, some higher power or something showing me that this was more my purpose. Um, Because I remember a lot thinking that time, like, what is my purpose? Like, what am I supposed to be doing in the world? And I'd write in my little diary, you know, (laughs) like, but again, I watched a lot of Oprah. So I was like, you know, what's my purpose? How can I give back to people? Those are those motivational tapes as well. Yeah, probably. (laughs) (laughs) So you go back to Australia, you pursue law, I guess, for the money. You just thought that was a good... Well, um, because my father had dropped out. Okay. I definitely wanted to have a college degree. And he always said that was his biggest regret, that he never got his business degree. And because I'd got, it was so hard to get into this law school, it almost had to be near perfect in all your exams. So I just thought, oh, I may as well just do it as well. Were you ever trying to impress either one of them more than the other? Oh, my mum just wanted, her dream for me was to be normal, I guess. (laughs) Like, you know, to have friends to kind of have a, you know, relationship and be kind of normal. So it's not like she definitely didn't want me to be some kind of a known public person. Sometimes the oldest sibling, you're the oldest of four, right? Yes. Is a bit of a reflection of, of more so of a reflection, I think, of what the parents wanted for themselves. I, I tend to think that's yeah. a bit of a... So I'm wondering if your like desire for success and validation or if it was something that you felt from your father, like, you know, him, he couldn't be that himself. So maybe he reflected that more praise on you when you were objectively successful in the things that you did. Um, wh- why would you want to be a lawyer? Is Yeah, I just, because if you were smart, you'd go was, into uh, law or medicine. Yeah. Um, and, and so, you know, and they would have loved to have gone around and said, you know, oh, my daughter's a lawyer at this firm. And that would have been a great, you know, great career that they would have thought that my parents had to work really hard to send me to the school that I did. Like at one point, apart from selling all the dog products, my dad was also working at the gas station overnight and, you know, just to afford my school uniforms and stuff Mm -hmm. like that. So, so for them, a successful outcome would have been, okay, she got into the top law school and now she's going to be a lawyer. And therefore all that money spent on education was worth it. And you go back, you do end up qualifying as a lawyer. Yeah. Um, you become a lawyer. Um, it did take me 10 years, 10 though. Years. It's normally a five-year double degree, and I did arts as well. Um, Why did it take so long? Because you're acting. So basically, yeah. So I would, I'd be in theatre shows at first, and then it would be TV shows. And my law school had an 80% attendance rule. So basically, if I started in a semester, and then for some reason my filming schedule or whatever, I'd have to repeat the subject. Because okay. if I didn't attend in person 80% of uh, the time, so it was exhausting. Um, often I was would fly, have to fly into state. I'd be filming in, in another state. I have to get up at 4 a.m. in the morning and uh, fly to Sydney to law school and then fly all the way back that night. From the, from the first time you did whatever you class as like an acting gig mm-hmm. or tried to be an actress to the moment when you feel like you had made it, how many years is that? So I started quite late, I guess. I started like 18 turning 19, which is quite late, I think. A lot of people start. Kids. Yeah, 12, 13, I guess. Um, And then that was like proper acting classes, like proper like with people wanting to do it as a career. And then I had, I wrote my first play at 21. I just wrote it in two nights. And then it won this playwriting competition and got put on. Um, And I was like, holy crap. Um, and then a television station gave me $90,000 to put it on professionally, which was like kind of insane, great luck for the first thing I'd ever written. Um, and I realized from that point, nobody saw me as an actor. I wasn't like Nicole Kidman or that, you know, in that vein. 
So I realized pretty quick I had to write myself my own material if I was going to make it. But I didn't start earning a professional, like a full-time wage um, until I was a regular on a TV show at 23. At what point in this journey towards being an actress do you realize that your weight is influencing how people see you and the way that they're casting you? So when I was like uh, about 21 into like 22, uh, I had something called PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome. And one of the key signifiers of that was like rapid weight gain. So all of a sudden, I mean, when I first started acting, I was just a regular size, a bit athletic looking, but, you know, pretty regular. Um, and, and then all of a sudden I gained 30 kilos and was like, and I had some other symptoms as well. I had like some dark hair on my arms and there's, there's a couple of key signifiers to it. And then I went to the doctors and I said, oh yeah, you've got PCOS. And in that first play that I'd written when I was 21, I'd cast a girl who was bigger the you know, quite a large girl. And then I noticed on stage, like she'd get way more laughs than me. And I kind of wrote all the roles quite evenly and I was like, why is that girl getting getting more laughs? And I honestly thought, I mean, well, one, she's hilarious, but it's because she's bigger and people like laughing at bigger people. And then the, I did this subject at university called Comedy and Power and basically, you know, there is a science to if you normally, if you want to sleep with somebody, you're not normally wanting to laugh at them. So, you know, if you want to sleep with someone, you're into them, attracted to them. But normally the people that you want to laugh at are people that have some kind of immediate physical irregularity, like, you know, bigger women do do well in comedy. Um, you might be really tall, really short. You might have a really big nose, something something about you that's quite distinctive um, that people can instantly go, aha, uh-huh, you know. And they, in more in comedy, the science of it is more people want to be your friend rather than they don't want to be your lover. They they want to be your friend. And they think, you know, you'd be good to hang out with and have a laugh with. And so it was really interesting when I gained all this weight, I was like, ah, oh, I think I'm going to lean into comedy because um, even though I would tried to be a serious actress at first, I was like, hang on, this which could be seen as a huge negative. A lot of people would be going, oh no, you know, I put on all this weight. Instead, I went the opposite way and was like, you know what? I could use this to my advantage. I like comedy. I, f- I, I think I should go into comedy and use being bigger as just what, you know, a good tool in my comedy toolbox. And then that was kind of reinforced, I guess, because then you people laugh harder and then they pay yeah, you more. Yeah, and, and it say- is true. It is, it, is, it is true. People like laughed laughed more and I lent into comedy and then I got a scholarship from Nicole Kidman uh, to go to New York and I went to uh, Second City Comedy School in New York at the time. Um, And yeah, and then I just realised I had quite a good knack for it and that was taking off more than the dramatic acting. How did you feel about yourself at that time? Well, I guess... uh, I was quite shocked in my diaries when I looked back at them for research for the book. Even when I was 16 and I wasn't big at all, I was very athletic, played lots of different sports, and and my first goal was, like, to lose two kilos. I guess because my mum had made a comment at some point, not not for any bad reasons. She just, you know, thought she had weight issues herself and just thought, you know, if I lost those two kilos, I might feel better in myself or something like that. And so I just, when I gained all that weight, there's kind of a dichotomy because at one point I'm like, this could help me professionally in comedy. And, you know, big girls do do better in comedy. I can see a pigeonhole for myself in that area and you can be successful. And I'd just gotten on a television show when I was 23 playing kind of the, I guess, the whale character is what they sometimes refer to me as. And they refer um, to you as the whale character. Yeah, well, like, I was the obese girlfriend of one of the guys who he was embarrassed to go out with me. So the whole joke was, like, he was trying to hide me because he didn't want people to know I was in a relationship because I was obese. And that was the whole 
it was a very popular show in Australia. It's called Fat Pizza. And, and so on the one hand, there's that. But then on the other hand, I felt like I, I knew I was eating very badly. I mean, my diet at that point was just carbs, pretty much. I remember coming to New York and going to comedy school and, you know, and just eating a pint of ice cream for dinner or a whole big bag of chips or something. And, and then, and I, so on the one hand, I could be confident and know that this could be good for me career-wise. But on the other hand, I knew I'm not treating myself right. This is not good. You know, I'm not being healthy. Um, and so I had both going on in my mind at the same time. How do you um, play a role in a movie, that fat pizza movie, where you're basically a someone something's somebody that somebody else is embarrassed about and mm. how does that not impact your self-esteem at some level because i'm thinking if i was playing in a movie someone uh, some, an individual that someone was trying to hide the thing is like because when it's acting it's not quite you and only uh, on a rare occasion would people confuse like because obviously the guys on the show were pretty great and respectful off off camera and everything um, it was that was just the character I was playing, mm -hmm. and I was lucky to be on a comedy show and uh, to be earning money that way. But then I remember going to a post office and just like mailing a letter, and the guy was obviously a fan of the show, and so I was saying, "Oh, Tula, that was my character name. Oh, he's so fat, you know." And like he in real life was saying stuff like the guy is on the show, but this is now real life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was very hurtful in. In real life, whereas for acting, it's you know you kind of can separate it a little what bit. What did you say to him that day? That post post office. Person? I didn't say anything. I just kind of walked out and thought, oh, that guy's an idiot. He doesn't understand the distinction between a comedy show and you know a real person. And and so that was just a bit hurtful. <laughs> um, but it. But I guess it must. But then, on the other hand, it's it's hard to feel sorry for myself because then obviously not in Australia but then when I came to America and played like Fat Amy which was probably my most famous character I mean now I'm making millions of dollars from playing the the fat funny girl and really leaning into that and so and what do you care about more the millions of dollars yeah. or the you know what I mean and that's well the, now I care about my health and well-being yeah. but, but back then I guess I thought oh well I'm becoming successful and this is helping me become successful. I think this is really at the heart of what your book takes on is the idea that, you know, we can become quote unquote successful mm -hmm. in the eyes of the world, but that doesn't necessarily mean we're successful holistically yeah. in all the things that we need to, to be successful. And I, I, I relate to that so much because because of the things we've described about being driven and dragged and all that stuff, I think I became successful in one of maybe the 10 things that I needed to be to be like rounded as a person. Yeah. And anomalies like you that achieve such great success, often there's a trade-off. Yeah. So I felt like I needed like Olympic athlete dedication to make it in the entertainment business. I mean, the odds of making it are so small. One, to make it in my home country and then to come to Hollywood and, and to make it. Um, the odds are, you know, millions to one, really, mm -hmm. of having the career that I've had. Um, so, you know, like an Olympic gymnast, if you meet people and they're like incredible at gymnastics, but then you talk to them um, about their personal life or their their skills and uh, and then basically you can tell they're like stunted, yeah. I guess, is the, is the right word? Um, so they've had this drive and this focus and they've achieved and they've, if they're an athlete, you know, they get to the Olympics or, or to me, like I've been in an Oscar nominated movie. Um, I haven't won, obviously the vision hasn't come true. Um, but, but was I stunted? I was like, if you really knew me, you'd know that, yeah, I hadn't been on a, out on a date, um, until my early thirties. I hadn't had that into intimate experiences and uh, and relationships, and so all that area of my life like wasn't great. But I was like the most successful person to ever come out of my high school. 
or, you know, so like there were great things. I could go courtside at the LA Lakers games or, you know, like there were awesome stuff. But then there was like, uh, yeah, on a personal side, I wasn't the the best person. And then I, then I knew that. I knew, oh, God, okay, so I've excelled in one area, but now there's others that I'm like quite lacking in. And the other area was apart from love life and kind of social life was also um, health. You ha- you move to America. Um, you get um, you work very hard for the next couple of years. You get this you know this opportunity in Bridesmaid, which then takes some time for it to come out. You, mm, yeah. I, I read in your book that you got paid three thousand five hundred dollars for your role in Bridesmaid, yeah, which is quite so, shocking. Um, yeah, that was my first job in America, and I mean, I was very lucky to to get it. I mean, what an awesome cracker of a movie to get that, but to be paid that little and basically that $3,500 I then had to pay to the union to join the union. So I basically, I made no money. I lost money because I had to pay to go to the premiere, like to buy my (laughs) dress and everything. So I lost money doing bridesmaids. But, and then you have to wait. It normally takes a whole year when you film a movie for the movie to be released. So that was a really skint year where I was living on $60 a week in LA once I'd paid my rent and my car hire. And that's not a lot of money. So like I wasn't partying or living living this life. It was basically uh, just having that focus, trying to write for myself, like going to auditions and um, and I had to wait a whole year till Bridesmaids came out and then suddenly it comes out as this big hit and I booked six movies off the back of it, one of which was Pitch Perfect, uh, which was kind of my real golden ticket, um, that movie. And... Became the highest grossing musical comedy franchise of all time. Yes. And there was... Yeah, very, very, very successful and very, very awesome, fun movies to be a part of. So they're like, they're like such a gift, those movies. Your life changes at that point mm-hmm. because you, you're sort of globally, internationally famous now. And surely that means job done. We can, yeah. we can chill, we can go look at other things. And I say this because there's so many people, me being probably one of them, that maybe told ourselves in the past that once we hit the pitch perfect, the global smash hit success, then we'll chill. Then you'll be happy and then it'll be <laughs> fine. And then, uh, but then of course, then you come up with some different goals <laughs> yeah. that I'm like, it's even harder. You guys may have heard our most recent news, the launch of Flight Studio, which is our brand new podcast and media technology company. As we scale this new company, we also need to scale our team. And my first port of call for hiring across Flight Studio has been LinkedIn Jobs, who are a sponsor of this podcast. We're hiring for around 30 to 60 roles right now, and LinkedIn has been me and my team's go-to. The platform makes the hiring process intuitive, smooth, and super efficient. LinkedIn has helped me and my team source professionals we can't can't get anywhere else. Even those who aren't actually searching for jobs right now, but might be open to the perfect role with us. In a given month, over 70% of LinkedIn users don't visit other leading job websites, they visit LinkedIn. So if you're not looking on LinkedIn, you're looking in the wrong place. So today I'm giving the Diary of a CEO community a free LinkedIn job post. Head to linkedin.com slash DOAC now and let me know how you get on. Terms and conditions apply. A real pup pivotal moment and turning point in your life is clearly when you went to that doctor that day after deciding that you wanted to have a child Mm -hmm. yeah why did you decide you wanted to have a child was there an influence something you'd seen or something I guess I never thought because I was so career driven I thought uh you know I'd never thought I would want to have a family um and also being in my business it was so it's so egocentric the business Um, and so I just didn't think that was in the cards for me. And I also thought, oh, well, I'm probably never going to find a partner or whatever. And then I was just like this biological clock inside me when in my late thirties just started like ticking really loudly. And I kind of say it's like in Peter Pan, that crocodile that has the clock inside it. It was just like, like you could hear it going tick, 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 tick. I was like, do it now. Like it'll, otherwise it'll be too late. And I would see babies on the street with their mums and be like, oh, and I just like, cause you keep staring at all the babies <laughs> and, and just like, like, I just really felt this urge in, inside me to be a mother. And even though I didn't have a partner at that point, and uh, I just was like, uh, I think I should, uh, try. And, and, but I was getting, I was like 39 years old 
and I didn't even know that I had eggs or what could be done. And um, and then I went to the fertility doctor, and and by this point, like I'm living this really large life. You know, I am medically obese, but I'm living this kind of amazing life. I traveled the world. I learned how to have fun and uh, not be so much of a workaholic. And I was like, you know, like that Lizzo song, like, it's bad bitch o'clock. Like that was like my life. Like I'm walking around just loving it. I've been successful now. And, and then the doctor looks me up and down and goes, yeah, but you're not healthy. And he said, you have a much better chance of having a baby if you were healthy. And the way he said it with like kind of quite a lot of disdain in his voice, I was like, huh, because that's that was a stranger. Most people, you know, in Hollywood, they're not going to come up to you and go, oh, you're engaging in bad, you know, eating habits, obviously. Like um, they're just like, oh, congratulations on your new movie and yay, it's great. You, um, you play Fat Amy and that's awesome and Did how successful it's are? been. Uh, I don't think so. He wasn't in my demographic. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> he looked a bit like the doctor from uh, Doc from um, Back to the Future. Okay, yeah. Older guy with white, wiry yeah, hair. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I don't think he was in the Picture Perfect fan base. And he just he just said it straight to my face. And then I go, oh, I'm not healthy. Cause, and I knew deep down I just suppressed those feelings, but... I knew deep down I wasn't healthy, but I didn't have any serious diseases. I was doing incredible things all around the world. So I just didn't. And then he said that and it like it really sunk in. There was like this criticism that was, I couldn't ignore. And I was like, oh God, okay, yeah, he is right. And I'm not healthy. Um, because on the one hand, I'm like a beacon of body positivity and that because I really do think beauty is at any size and um and and had and had grown you know so much self confidence um by that point but then I, on the other hand I knew I was engaging in unhealthy eating behaviors and that was something I wanted to improve in myself and then I thought well the next year 2020 I'll make the whole year about getting healthy like I said I'm not going to work weirdly I couldn't have predicted that a pandemic was going to happen uh, I'd already planned not to work that year and to take a whole year to do health stuff. You you get back in the car after that doctor visit and you describe kind of your what's going on in your brain. But yeah. you, you've, as you said, you know, at that point, you, you knew you weren't healthy deep down, deep down. Yeah. Um, Everyone kind of knows, you know. You know, we all know. If you, if you yeah. are medically obese, you kind of know that, yeah. But it's hard right. to get from there to m- taking any action. It's really hard to to change behavior in such a way. Yes, especially because I, yes, had I tried to go on diets before, had I gone on diets, had I gone to like a little health farm and, you know, lost five, seven pounds in a week and and then you never sustain it and then it goes back up. So I'd like, it's not like I'd never tried. I just never thought because always the weight would come back on and that was just my homeostasis or whatever from my body was like at 102 kilos and that's kind of just how it was and I was like oh well I could never permanently change that I just thought nah I can get two degrees from university and become an international movie star but I just can't like with the weight I was like I can't like just you know I don't know I'm just not right in that area I would never I would never be healthy in that way and that one comment from that stranger. Yeah, it was something in the bit. way he said it. I was like, sugar, I'm not, I'm like, I'm not healthy. Like, and he that must be a what a lot of people thought. They just never said it to my face. Um, and then it was kind of the motivation, almost not really for myself and my health, but for a future child. Mm-hmm. That I thought, well, now I've got to fix this um, and work really hard um, to do it. Because if I, I tr- I'd tried so many times, to- I don't know, 20 times or whatever in the past, to, but it always only lasted a short term. And then I was like, well, okay, but this is different because now the motivation is to have a child. So that's like a different motivating factor. You want to have a child. This doctor says you'll have a better chance if you're healthy. Mm. You leave there that day. 
you must also have it in the back of your mind that people are paying you millions and millions and millions of dollars. I think around that time that year, you'd made like $20 million in movies mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, they're paying you because you fit this persona that they want. Yeah. So, so as soon as I started telling people in my team about this, they're like, oh, no, 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 no. Why would you want to lose weight? Like that. No, I wouldn't. If I was you, I wouldn't do that. Because then you lose your multi-million dollar pigeonhole that you've so successfully created. And look at all the work you've done to get that. And now you're just going to throw it away. So I was then literally like, okay, what do I do with my life? Am I get healthy? But I lose my career? Or do I just stay the way I am and maybe never have a child? And like that was literally kind of how it was positioned to me. And so even though literally everyone around me pretty much said, stay as you are, I just felt like, nah, I got to, <laughs> I think I know deep down that I'm engaging in unhealthy behaviors and I'm going to, I'm going to work on my health and try to have a child thinking at that point, I know it sounds simplistic, but thinking that my career could be over then. But I was like, nah, it's too, that's too important. Going on that journey, losing the weight and all those kinds of things is never a straight line. Yeah, no, it's, it was, the, I mean, the pandemic helped a lot because literally everything stopped um, and and I could just focus uh, focus on being healthy. It was, it, that became a big blessing um, to me. And when I really focused and did the emotional work, because there's things like that I write about in the book that I just never thought about until I started emotionally processing things. Did one of your contracts say, I think it was pitch perfect, say that you couldn't lose 10 pounds of weight contractually? Yeah, so that's like quite common. You can't drastically change your appearance. So that's pretty much in all acting contracts. Um, it's not just about weight. It's about your hair, you know, what, what you look like. Um, and you can't go, you know, too much either side. Um that's basically because sometimes in films you have to do reshoots uh, or sometimes, you know, they might want to do a sequel or something and so you kind of have to stay the same. So literally, like, I have to ask somebody if I'd want to cut my hair right now uh, to a different colour or style or whatever. It's just it's just a thing in the business because you could be asked to do a reshoot on a film a year later. Mm -hmm. You have to kind of look the same. So this journey of losing weight, tell me about this process. What helped you? So I was like, as you can probably tell, like I'm quite goal orientated, and uh, and so I was like, okay, 2020 is going to be my year of health. I'm themed it. I'm going to put it on Instagram, so I'm like held responsible. Yeah. Uh, you know, the other times it would be a bit more private. Like, okay, I'm going to go to this health farm or whatever, and I'm like, okay, it's going to be my year of health, and I'm just going to focus on being healthy. And um, the the thing Anne Hathaway introduced me to this doctor who was. Um, great because I th guess she saw me on a film we did together called The Hustle and she kind of saw me struggling mm -hmm. and his specialty was kind of dwelling into emotional emotions and how they can affect your physical health mm -hmm. and I never even thought about that like I just thought you know going on a diet is about eating less and exercising more and um, I just never thought but to me because I was an emotional eater really the kicker was that to process emotions and to learn how to process emotions. And obviously from my family environment, I had definitely not learned um, any skills in that area and was kind of holding on to everything like a so like a bag of groceries of this little trauma and this and, the, and they are holding on to it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I had to start processing that um, with the doctor. Like we did a phone call every two weeks. And, and at first it's awful. You're like, oh my God, what do I talk about? You know, and talk about my personal things. And it felt awful to do it at first. Um, and then I did it and then gradually it kind of, I started processing things and then I could release them, the emotions and, and then, and then the weight loss kind of came. But because I wasn't working, I, I did do crazy workouts. Like I was wor working out like two hours, two and a half hours a day um, to help, you know, to help accelerate it. I was cooking my own meals. I was, you know, concentrating on eating high protein meals and 
like I was just doing all the right things because I didn't have any stress of work and um and I was just like okay this is going to be it but the real thing was the emotional what what are those bags that you let go of emotionally I think a lot of it like I don't think I would have been able to write this book if I hadn't have done that uh, emotional work with the doctor because um there were just stuff that I suppressed you know a lot of stuff about my father and my complicated relationship with him and and the sadness of him dying um uh he suddenly had a heart attack and uh, and died right you know close after pitch perfect 1 came out um and i think just all these little things in my childhood um that you know i just i guess i never thought that that was associated with my weight but it obviously was and because I hadn't processed the things, it was was like I was holding on to barriers. It was like the weight was a barrier, one for like intimacy, for example. You know, I never wanted a relationship or wanted to be attractive or whatever, and the weight was kind of a barrier because that kept all the people Is, away. Do you, do you believe that? I've heard that from psychologists a few times, even on this podcast before. I've heard one particular guy called Johan Hari who wrote a book called Lost Connections tell me that in a study where they looked at um, women who were clinically obese and then they put them through a weight loss program, mm. they found that some of the women would then re regain weight and the catalyst for that was them being hit on. They discovered in those women that there was oh. early sort of abuse or there was issues. So they, they made this link that sometimes we use weight as a defense from sort of sexual advances. Or And I definitely was because I wanted to be in the fat, funny friend role which I played quite well in real life and on screen because I didn't, you know, I didn't want somebody to be coming home with me and then seeing how I really lived or felt, you know. Why? I don't know. I guess I just was embarrassed or, Do you remember yeah. men or women hitting on you at any point in your 20s and then actively no. rejecting them? Or so I literally was like, for some people like, um, but didn't anybody come up to you or whatever? I was like, no, like I honestly don't remember one person. Um, apart from the little boyfriend I had when I was 16, which was the most innocent thing ever, where we just held hands and maybe kissed once. But, anyways, uh when I got famous from Pitch Perfect, there was like a waiter at Chateau Marmont that like gave me his number and like, you know, basically said, you know, oh, uh, take me home with you tonight kind of thing. And I was shocked. And I was there with my buddy, Matt Lucas. And I was like, what do I do with this? Like, it was kind of like the first attention. Mm -hmm. So only when I started like noticing any attention was when I became very successful. So that did, I almost felt like I was an in invisible attractiveness wise until that point. Did you text the waiter? No, I didn't. But Why? Matt goes, you should have. What are you doing? Go go for it. And I go, Matt, no. Like, I, well, I was so shy in that area. I was like, I'm not just going to bring a waiter home from the Chateau Marmont. Um, we did I get a lot of people from prison as well when I became famous. They'd like DM you and like go, oh, be my wife and all this stuff. And I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> like, but no, like I just, unless I was just so blocked off to that, I didn't notice anything. You know, but, when, when, a, yeah. when a woman in particular gets over 30, what I've mm -hmm. heard, yeah. especially considering some of my friends who are women over 30, yeah. is people around them sometimes start getting a bit pushy. Mm -hmm. Like their friends start, you know, come on, rebel, yeah. come on, I'll go for him, I'll give him a chance. Yeah. Did you feel that sort of external pressure at all from people Weirdly, around you? My father would always say, oh, on the limited times we talk, oh, are you seeing anybody? I'd always get so angry at that question. I'd like... Why is he asking me that as if I'd want to get married like him and my mum were and how terrible that was? And I'd always just get angry at it and just be like, no. And just like, I don't know, it just shut down uh, about that issue. Is it because but, it came from him who was... Yeah, in particular. And I was like, oh, God, what, like out of all the people to say something, most people didn't didn't say anything. But I know there is that pressure like... Uh, for single women over 30, you just get like a little bit. And, uh, but I felt it more in my later 30s. Um, and I, I went on a dating app at, at one point to like try to meet people 
How did that go? Because I was like, well, I actually met some good people. In uh, real life? Yeah. It was okay. that dating app, um, Raya, oh, that yeah. has some celebrities on it. It wouldn't let me on it. I tried when I was what? 18. I tried when I was 18. I, I didn't have anything going on in my life, but I tried. And uh, the problem is... They, you would have been great. I think, now yeah. they, I think they give me a shot now. But back then, I submitted my application when I was like 19. So they're still looking at the same application and I'm still in the waiting list. So. Uh, but now I'm in a relationship and I don't need that. So Yeah, you don't need it now. <laughs> so it's their loss. Um, but I was... Yeah, I, no, I went on and I you know dated a few great guys and actually had had fun and it was good but I had to because I was so behind the eight ball on dating and love and relationships like I had to almost like in my year of health I had to do like a year of love experiment before I did that before year of health um to like kind of put myself out there which was hard and challenging like it's awful going on dates and you got to get all dressed up and mm. you know and then go and have it lunch or dinner with someone that you might not know whether there's any chemistry and and you were a virgin up to 35 yes yeah that's right yeah so going on those dates is there is there anxiety in your brain because you know if this date goes well there might be an expectation that i go to the bedroom with this individual yeah well that was all later i mean weirdly the the guy i lost my virginity to at 35 i was i was set up with and and i think part of why i think I might have been attractive was because I was in, in like a number one movie at the time and whatever. And that guy was like uh, an awesome guy and I'd met him and I'd waited so long at that point. I really wanted to lose my virginity to someone who I was really, really into. And I, and I just, I really liked this guy. I thought he was so funny and cute and, um, and potentially like marriage material at the time I met him. And so and so when I did my year of love experiment, that was like a few years later. So obviously, I, I mean, I don't think I could have done it if I was still a virgin and going on all these dates because um, at least I had some experience by that point. But I dated like 50 people in the one year in, in 2019 um, to just get some, I don't know, like to find it. Like because I just was behind the eight ball. I'd never dated properly. Um, so I needed to get some experience in that area and, and legitimately trying to find the one, but, um, yeah, it didn't, didn't quite work out. You mentioned that you experimented with a Zempec. Oh, I did, but I wish I'd known about it in 2020. Mm, it wasn't big then. No, I didn't even, if I had known about it, I would have tried it hundred mm. percent. Um, but more for, uh, I'd, once I'd lost like 35 kilos, I was like, I can't continue working out and having this level of focus. Like, mm -hmm. I can't. And I was very worried that the weight would come back on. And then now, like, I mean, now I have gained back um, 10 kilos or so because of, um, I guess, having a baby. I I just can't work out in the level that I used to. And then I directed a movie, which was a lot of sitting on a chair all day long and mm -hmm. being stressed, still stress eating. And which I'll get under control when I'm, you know, not working seven days a week. Um, uh, and so I've tried it for a few months for like weight management, I guess you'd, Did it help? I guess you'd call it. Um, I definitely noticed that it it did I have like an unlimited ability to eat sweets and chocolate and ice cream and stuff. And that drug helped um, for me not to feel full, mm -hmm. whereas I wouldn't feel like that before I would just could eat a ton of it, like, you know. Um, so so I actually actually liked it. But um yeah, I know I think I actually think for people like me, those drugs can be really effective. But obviously I'm not on it right now. But maybe if I, you know, prescribed it by a doctor, I'd go back on it. When you lose weight, your resonance with your audience changes as well. Mm -hmm. Because to a, I, mean, I think Adele spoke to it as well. And when she lost a lot of weight, she there was a backlash. A, yeah. I mean, just... I think there was some people going, oh, she won't be funny anymore. But then I had this movie come out senior year where I play a cheerleader who went into a coma and then wakes up 20 years later. And uh, that was my first big comedy. And it got something like 89 million unique Netflix accounts. Watch it in the first 10 days around the world. Oh which was huge, huge, huge numbers. So I was like, oh, well, I think they're probably, the people are wrong about the, that I won't be funny anymore. Or, But did they feel let down? I think people? some people did. It's like, say, if you're in a family and 
your sibling makes a change for the better and then you feel like, oh, well, it makes me feel bad because I didn't make the change Mm -hmm. and it makes me feel not as good about myself so therefore I'm going to hate them for for changing. How dare they change? How dare they try to rise above? Mm -hmm. Um, And I think there is some attitude but then you think to those people, what would make them happy? You go like the John Candy way and you die of a heart attack or, you know, or something happens to you. Like you get some serious, uh, I mean, my father died of a heart attack with complications with diabetes. So I was like, I was heading towards the diabetes route if I kept going. And I was like, well, does that make those people happy? Or you just stay as you are and be unhealthy and then you die prematurely. That's not a great outcome like what do those people want but I think as a comedian you have so many different things in your toolkit uh, and mainly they're your personality and uh, so even though it's easy to go oh you have that physical irregularity and that's why people laugh there are so many other elements it's not as simplistic as that and so I just utilize slightly different things. Have you noticed any change in the way that people book you professionally or, or respond to you professionally, the roles you're given based on your... Well, now I do a lot more dramatic stuff. I mean, I'm still obviously doing the comedy stuff. I mean, I've just directed a movie, which is a big, huge new career step. But yeah, I've got a movie coming out, The Almond and the Seahorse here in the UK, which is totally serious. And I just played Lady Capulet in a film, which is totally not what you'd think I would, I would do. Uh, and it's awesome, but it's kind of how I started my career doing Shakespeare and stuff um, before I was bigger. And so it's kind of coming back now to, to doing that kind of thing. But more I noticed, um, I mean, now I'm kind of in the middle because I'm like, I've gained back some weight. It was so weird to be to be someone who f- walks around the world kind of feeling a bit invisible, um, attractiveness-wise. And then suddenly I lost all this weight and got so much positive validation. Like it was insane. Like people would open doors for you or carry your groceries to the car for you or offer to do something for you or whatever. And I just, it was so weird to experience that. And I've experienced both sides of the coin, like to be kind of being invisible in that area and then to be visible. And it was, it was bizarre. It was like the attention. And I was like, oh, is this what hot people feel or get all the time? Um, and they get this kind of positive bias in society all the time. Um, and I got such positive reinforcement for losing weight, um, from the press and from people like every single person would make some comment about it. And, and it's hard not to fall into liking that. And, you know, now I've just been too stressed being a director that I've kind of gone off the band health bandwagon, but You've got. I will get back on it. Forty-two years old, you underwent IVF, and you had your daughter, mm-hmm. Royce. Um, but it appears you're still a workaholic. Mm-hmm. You just said earlier about working seven know, days a week. I know. I've I've come off a nine-month marathon of seven days a week. Of I did an action film um, called Bride Hard, directed my movie The Deb, written the book, and yeah. So I'm about to have a holiday. <laughs> what are you doing it for? Um, because you could. You know, you've got multiple houses all over the world. Yeah. You've got huge success. You've you've d- you've done it, Rebel. I know, and I and my love life. There is a happy story to mm-hmm. everyone listening. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. I I have an amazing partner, Ramona, who's absolutely an incredible partner. Um, and so that story had had a happy ending as well. I just keep saying to people, "Oh, I'm going to retire now." You know. And then they're like, yeah, you'll have like two days off and then you'll have some idea for a movie and then you'll want to do it. Um, so I think I'm always that little girl who at the dog shows was like reaching into bins to collect the aluminium cans to re- earn money because I felt like I didn't have anything because I didn't have any money. And so so part of me is always that. I have just have this drive to earn money um, and and that that motivates me. And then it's... We like I achieve a goal. I like I remember coming to America. It was just to be in one Hollywood movie, but then you achieve it, and then it's not enough. And then you want you know. And now like you know, I'd like to win an Oscar, or you know, um, have that level of success. You know, winning the Oscar is going to change zilch. I know, probably not. It probably like there's a curse on some women that win the Oscars. Uh, then they sometimes their love life 
you know, crumbles and they they get no jobs for two years when after they win the Oscar. Sometimes it's like that. a curse. You didn't see that in the hallucination. What happened after? No, I didn't see that. I just saw winning and feeling great about it. I, I mean, I definitely know I need a break over the summer, and I will have have fun times. And I've learned how to have fun now because before, like in my twenties, I didn't even do that. Like I wouldn't even go on a holiday. I'd be like, no, I have to keep working hard. Are you are you concerned? And I'm asking this really for myself here because I think I am. Are you concerned that you're going to look back later in life and go, do you know what, I didn't have my priorities in order? Yeah, maybe. And so I think having my gorgeous daughter and looking at at her, she makes me want to like not work as much. And I think I didn't know how she was going to affect my life. Um, And then now just knowing how much joy it is just to be around her and it makes me think, less about myself and more about her and my family um and so from that level I want to um not not work as much and I have to be a bit more selective you one of the things that I found I have to say awesome I'm just going to be honest with you Aww. in your book was um well there's so many things I love the pictures and the, oh, yeah. uh, the whole design of the book and how you weave humor into what I consider to be pretty important lessons of life but <laughs> Oh, you're holding up the redacted the, pages. There's yeah. pages that are, that just have black lines through them, which yeah. means that you've basically removed those sections. Now you, well, I didn't remove them. Okay, the, the publisher, the, publisher did, did. the UK publisher did, yeah. because in the in the UK the laws are different here around yes. what you can say about instances in your life. Yeah, and being a qualified lawyer, I know you know all about defamation laws, mm-hmm. um, and it's a bit um, the the US is a bit more free speech in, in terms of defamation laws and the UK and Australia have higher standards. This chapter is called Sasha Barracone and Other, Other Assholes. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, I'm just going to take your lead on this. Yeah. But um, this has been a huge story. And I saw on your Instagram, yeah, some it's, Instagram posts. It's weird because the book is about my whole life, yeah. you know, and yet this particular chapter has gotten the most attention, I guess, because I'm saying something negative about a, a male comedian, Sasha Baron Cohen, um, and in it describing like the worst professional experience of my career, which was 10 years ago now uh, on a movie called Grimsby and working with him. And it was an experience that left me feeling humiliated and degraded as a person. And, and so that chapter, I guess, because he's come out and, uh, denied it, it became a, a big story. What can you say about that experience? I can say why I wrote it um, and purely why it's redacted is um, because it's the publisher that gets sued and obviously they, they wouldn't want to get um, get sued by somebody who's quite litigious. So, so that's why they did that. But the story is pretty much out there. Yeah. Um, so you could easily kind of work mm-hmm. out uh, what I'm talking about uh, in the book. But I wanted to write it because uh, my story is not one of, um, you hear stories, terrible stories of assault and, you know, um, thing things in Hollywood. Mine is not that. Uh, it's more just ugh, kind of a shit situation at work that the 44-year-old version of me would have left and would have said, oh, screw you, I'm out of here. I'm, you know, got enough self-esteem to leave and know this isn't a good situation for me. Mm-hmm. And then back then I stayed in it and and I did reshoots on on the film because I didn't want to be seen as unprofessional. And this was before the Me Too movement and even though I wasn't being treated great, I just... I thought, oh well, I have to be professional, um, and and I have to stay and and finish it. Uh, and it was a complicated situation. We were both represented by the same agent at the time, and um, there are a few things going on. And and I guess I wrote it so that people, the more people talk about stuff like this, hopefully, the less it happens. And then also, um, just I think I held shame because I went along with it and it's such a fine line between com- what's comedy and what's playing a character yeah, and then really crossing the line into personal humiliation. Um, 
and, and I think on that project it did it did cross the line and I felt shame that I actively went along with it. And so I guess writing it is kind of re- releasing the emotions I was holding on to for that. And I have no motivation. I mean, I write in the chapter, it's not about cancelling somebody. It's just about, um, it kind of goes to show why my self-worth wasn't, um, wasn't where, where it should have been. And I should have stood up for myself and that's, that's hard. And now the 44 year old version of me would, uh, handle things much, much differently. And it's just, it was 10 years ago and it was hard to know what to do, even though I'm a lawyer and I'd made the complaints and did what I could do at the time, I now would act very differently. This is your life story. This is your memoir. Of all the experiences you've had, Rebel, when you look back through all of these pages and all of these days and all of these sort of seasons of your life, was there a, a hardest moment? Oh, God. There's been so many hard hard moment I think well probably the darkest point in my life was when I was about 13 and you know you you hit puberty and you feel all these emotions and I felt you know unlovable unworthy my life wasn't going to be anything um and I was just isolated we were living out in the bush at that that point where we had like snakes come crawling on the back porch and bush rats and like I was just living like it just was such a dark time um and that was probably the harder one of the hardest things what's what's next for rebel what's that well i'm still directing the movie because i've got all the technical elements to do now so that's a big new challenge and i've directed this very empowering musical that's very very joyful and i'm very it's hilarious so i'm very proud of that um and then i think I don't know, I still have, because that vision was I won an Oscar and I haven't won one, so I'd I'd like to do that. But then, you know, I would just like to be more of a mum who has, spends that quality time with her family and is, yeah, is that kind of uh, person and not so striving. But I don't know, I always have this thing in me that I'm very driven and working hard and just always had that but I would like to maybe let go of that. If you were to um, go back now to that 13-year-old rebel Mm. that was going through all of those sort of challenges in her mind and you could tell something, say something to her that would better equip her to, um, for the next sort of 20 years to come, because there's going to be lots of, you know, young women that are struggling with all the things you described and young men. Oh, yeah, and I know what it's like to feel invisible, to be so lonely, isolated, to just not feel like you have anything going for you. Like I was just a pretty average, I mean, I was smart. I always had being smart, but like it's average. No one really looked twice or thought twice about me. And, and, and I know what it's like, but it's, if you want to be determined and you want to change your life, like you can, and you don't have to stay in that situation. Like you can actively do things to make your life better and to make it more how you want. And I mean, at the time I just had to tell myself that there was nobody around to, to tell me that, but to those young people out there, I just think, um, you, you can, like you can actively take steps to do it. And a great thing is the creative arts because, which can be so many different things like writing or painting or, uh, not, not just acting and being on a stage all those things, because you might not know what your voice is or how to express yourself. And those kind of areas are so important because it can help you find your voice. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I would say to like, to try to encourage you to go into that, those kind of pursuits, even if it's just something you do in your bedroom with a notebook and you're writing song lyrics or you're yeah writing a diary or something. Um, that form of creative expression can be really, really useful. And you're the prime example of that in many respects. You went from being that extremely shy individual to the point, as you say, that people thought it was some kind of social disorder um, to being a Hollywood megastar. You also went, in the personal context, you went from being someone who lost their virginity at 35 years old and wasn't in a relationship and was very sort of clearly avoidant to being... Which I do slightly regret now. 
Like I was like, oh, maybe. But then, yeah, again, I do believe that I wouldn't have the career that I had if I'd focused more on relationships and and health before that. There's a lot of people out there that are arriving maybe in their late 30s mm-hmm. and that maybe have hear that clock ticking. Yeah. And then they reflect on the decisions they've made over the last 20 years and they say, do you know what, actually, I hear the clock ticking and I do want a family. A lot of people also say, I hear the clock ticking, I don't. Some people just don't hear the clock ticking at all. Yeah. Um, but there's a lot of people that are arriving at that age and going, okay, the priorities I had in hindsight now, maybe, I'll, maybe I got something wrong here earlier. And it's difficult. And I think that's really what your, your book does so well is it's so honest about that sort of internal conversation you had with yourself about, okay, there are changes I need to be made made if I want to achieve something else. And I've decided I want something else. And it, well, throughout your whole story, it's so clear that you can change. Yeah. And it's never too late to change. And it's... Yeah. And I really, if anybody listening is like a late bloomer like like me, I mean, I don't think there's any shame in that. And that's one of the reasons why I put that virginity story in the book, because like, on the one hand, it's very embarrassing for me to say that, but then if that helps other people out there feel like, oh, you know, okay, well, Rebel was like that and look at the life she has now. And um, so I would want them to not feel embarrassed about that because it doesn't really matter when you bloom, like what age or, um, you know, things have come to me later in life. But I think all that matters is that it, it has come to me. Um, now, why am I saying the word Nobody's, come so yeah. much? I'm just talking about virginity. I don't know. Um, but I, I, yeah, I just, I'm glad that my life turned out, you know, I didn't get all these awesome things in my 20s. It it happened later and, um, and, and that's okay. We have a closing tradition on this podcast where the last guest leaves a question for the next guest, not knowing who they're going to be leaving it for. Mm-hmm. And the question that's been left for you is, okay. those people that you love the most, what is preventing you from spending enough time hugging them? Are you able to change this? Okay, so what's, so the people I love the most, obviously, apart from my family is like my, you know, my daughter, my immediate family is my daughter and my partner. And what's preventing me from hugging them the most is literally physically not being with them because I'm like out out promoting the book and um uh or if I'm shooting something and it's not appropriate for the baby to come um so so not physically being in the same country or or city as them because I'm working too much and it says are you able to change this and I and I am able to change it by uh, not just accepting too much work and um you know prioritizing the family more. Rebel, your book is incredible. It's incredible for so many reasons because it seeks to answer those really critical questions that I think a lot of people are struggling with, which is about romance, it's about fertility, it's about am I good enough, it's about finding love, it's about... It's an honest reflection of what I think a lot of workaholics go through in the modern era while also weaving in a story which I don't think many people know about your early childhood and where you've really come from and all the odds you've had to fight against coming from where you've come from to get to where you ended up really remarkable in every sense of the word, but you confront the trade-offs, which a lot of people don't always talk about, those trade-offs we all have to make, because as you Mm. said in this conversation, you can't have it all in life. And so, you know, you can't have it all at the same time. Yeah. For sure. You can probably have it all, just not at the same time. Yes. And even, yeah, yeah, and life just presents these trade-offs, especially for people that are anomalies, they have to make even bigger trade-offs than others. It's a remarkably funny book um, in such a subtle, untry-hard way. Which is, is, no, 100%. (laughs) But even you in conversation are the same. You're funny without even trying, which is remarkable. And The Almond and the Seahorse, I I was told it was coming out on the 10th of May. Yeah, in cinemas here in the UK. Yeah, so it's out now and everyone can go and watch it. Yeah, Um, and that's about traumatic brain injury. It's a very serious uh, movie. And that was where I kissed my first woman in that movie, the French actress Charlotte Gainsbourg. And the rest is history. Yeah, that's, yeah, (laughs) part of my, big part of my life on screen. Rebel, thank you. Thank you, Stephen. I I really appreciate it. And it is my most vulnerable, intimate thoughts put out there. Um, But yeah, even if like 10 people relate to it and get something positive out of it, that's like, that means the world to me. And 
Um, so even why it's nerve wracking having the book out there, it's it's awesome at the same time. Uh-huh.